Today we are continuing our uh, study on book of Exodus, and today I want to talk about purpose. The purpose is the key to living a fulfilled life. How many of you th- have a purpose in your life? I- I'm not asking you to raise your hand. Just ask this question to yourself every day by day as I wake up. Am I ex- Excited to wake up because of purpose and goals and aim that I have in my life, or I'm just like, I don't want to wake up. I don't want to go to work oh, another same day again. So today we're going to th- we are going to think about the purpose that God has for us. I was curious about the countries people are most inclined to move to. I came across the chart indicating that the United States of America as the primary choice for relocation, significantly surpassing the runner-up, Russia. This raises a question. Why do people choose to move to the United States more than to other nations? I suppose that you are familiar with the concept of the American dream. What is the American dream? I will say this. The American dream encompasses the idea that anyone can start from humble beginnings and through their own effort, improve their circumstances and achieve a better life. It traditionally includes aspirations such as owning a home, obtaining a good education, having a stable job or career, and providing a better future for one's children. Is that a fair statement? So it is the idea that my life will gradually improve over time, presenting me with various opportunities to seize. This notion is at the heart of the American dream, the belief that tomorrow will be better than today. Well, looking back, it is hard to believe that when I first arrived in this country in 2007, all I had were two checked in bags. The memories of that day that I landed at O'Hare Airport, I can still remember very clearly. And as I reflect on the past 15 years, I must admit that my life has indeed improved despite of facing numerous challenges and setbacks along the way. There has been ups and downs, ups and downs, but it was upward slope. However, Let's consider a different scenario, one where hope seems non-existent. What if, despite pouring in relentless effort and hard work, the past centuries have been marred by continuous adversity or even a worse situations? In such circumstances, It's a nature for one's motivation to wake up each day to be greatly diminished. The Israelites endured a period period of enslavement lasting how many years? 400 years. I mean, during Joseph's time, they were treated very well because Joseph was a prime minister But their condition got worse after his death. Eventually, they found themselves in a a plight of slavery. And it is unlikely that they woke up each morning saying, it's going to be a great day. It's going to be a wonderful day. I have good feelings about today. I don't think so. When you're a slave, would you wake up every day filled with hope? I will be like, I don't want to wake up. I don't want to go to work. I'm a slave. I'm not even getting a paycheck. Every day is miserable. And there's no point to have a purpose or a goal for 
my life. But just like the Israelites experienced the loss of hope in their challenging times, we can witness a similar situations even in more recent history. A great example of this is Japan's flourishing era in 1980s that many of us might remember. Milton, you may be old enough to remember <laughs> when Japan, <laughs> their economy was booming. Everybody was getting Sony, Toyota, and all these Japanese brand. And in 19, and after, after the uh, devastation of World War II, Japanese economy was in, sh in, in, in ruins. But however, things got turned, things, things, things took a turn when the Korean War came along. Japan became a crucial hub for U.S. Support, uh, supplies, and this significantly, significantly boosted the, its economy. So it was quite shocking that during that time, the value of real estate in Tokyo skyrocketed to the point where it could have been traded for the entire United States. It is interesting how history can show us both the struggles and triumphs of different nations and how they bounce back from challenging times. And for Japan, the bubble popped in 1990s. Now you can see the Japanese the economy here. Their GDP is continually decreasing their, their income never increases. Like in America, we expect to get at least 3 to 5% increase on your salary every year, right? But if you go to Japan today, they're getting about 35,000 yen, which their parents are getting in 1985. Same amount of money. Because of recession, there's no inflation. The economy has been just stuck. This is the wage that you can see here. You can see the wage is not increasing. So as, as, as a, because uh, I'm not, you know, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. So if you start from the scratch, I mean, what is the way, one of the ways that we can actually uh, build our equity? Hello? What is the way, one of the ways that you can build your equity? Homes, right? So this is like the chart normally that you see. There might be ups and downs. This is the U.S. market you know, throughout the history. And you see the, the, inc uh, the increase of the housing market, and, there, and there's a drop, but then it continues to uh, grow. It's like upward slope that you're going to see. But on the other hand, this is Japanese real estate market. So their real estate hit its peak around 1992, and it continually, it continually decreases. So if you're living in Japan, there's no point of buying a house, because once you buy a house, your house is not an asset. It's a liability. It's like your car. The value is going down. So that situation creates a generation called Satori generation. They are mostly people in their 20s and 30s, starting from around 2010. You see, they were, they were born right uh, when the recession began, so they never really experienced any economic booms. As they grew up, the economy didn't show signs of significant improvement either, so because of this, they don't want to take any risks. They don't have clear goals or ambitions for their lives. They're not keen on pursuing full-time jobs. Instead, they prefer having a couple part-time jobs as they don't really want the heavy responsibilities that come with being a full-time employee. They are not particularly interested in seeking promotions or finding work in big cities either. 
buying a house isn't high or their least of priorities. So you see, when there's a no hope in societies, this young generation, they don't see any hope. And they refuse to have a purpose and goal in their life. I'd rather have a two part-time jobs than having a full-time job because it's not going to get any better. The similar things are happening in China in recent years. We may all heard that, you know, Chinese economy was booming and booming. Yes, it was. And since about early 2000, and since about uh, Beijing Olympic, you see their economy is going down every single year. It appears that, and, and, and I mean, as a result of this, a new generation has emerged called Tangping. Tangping generation. Tangping means, it's translated to lying flat. The question is, why are young Chinese individuals adopting this lying flat mindset? It boils down to a loss of purpose in life. In free countries, when there is a, their, their, their system is crooked, if you see there's a dictator, then you see the young people come out to take the street to protest against the corrupt government and system. But in China, they feel powerless because after Tiananmen Square incident and... No, that in China, in Beijing. Tiananmen is around 1990. Some of you are old enough to remember... What happened in 1990s, because that's when all the communism, communist countries are going down. So in 1990, Chinese people also joined the rally to bring the spring for Beijing. But then what happened? All the tanks came to the Tiananmen Square, and they literally kill the civilians. So this young generation, they remember that they... They know that, so they feel powerless due to the constraint imposed by the Chinese government. They don't want to risk their lives by challenging the government's authority. So instead of going out and protest, what are they doing? They lie flat. I don't want to do anything. They choose to say, I'm not going to take any action. I will not even seek employment. I can live with minimal expenses. The Israelites endured 400 years of slavery, which took a toll on their sense of purpose and identity. I mean, Korea was Japanese colony for 36 years. And that seemed eternity for us. And imagine the 400 years. They were enslaved. As we follow the book, in the book of Exodus, we see now God is working through Moses to reveal to them their mission and the greater purpose of their lives. And at this point in the story, now we, are, we find ourselves in chapter 12. Now God is really trying to boost their motivations. God is really trying to plant the seed of purpose in their life. As Paula mentioned in children's story, now you're going to get those golden servers. Now you are, you know, going to leave. Now you're having a purpose. You have a goal in your life. You're not going to settle here. You're going to move forward. And now there have been now nine plagues. And now in chapter 12, they are about to face the 10th plague. But the last one is different than the other ones. Because it emphasizes the crucial role of the sacrificial lamb 
foreshadowing the coming of Jesus Christ as their Savior, who would later fulfill this symbolism through his own bloodline. So 10th plague, now God is telling them, the Savior is coming through your bloodline, and you need to participate. But in order for you to do this, you've got to have a purpose. Then how are we going? To, how am I going to motivate you? So now, chapter 12, verse 1, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. This is kind of new beginning. Okay, whatever happened so far, now you got purpose, you got goal, new beginning. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. So if one house cannot afford the lamb because you're poor, then you chip in together, but it's got it's to be a lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goat. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. So now... God is now giving them, this is like the first chapter, okay, now I'm educating you. This is what is going to happen for the plan of salvation for the entire human race. And verse 7, And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire its head with its leg and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. Well, first question, why do they have to roast it instead of boil it? Because in order for you to boil something, you have to chop the meat. Because you may not be able to find like big jar or pot to put entire body of the animal. But when you roast something, you can just hook it in a, in a skew and just, you know, just barbecue that. It's, gonna, it's not going to take, it's not going to take the much a process. Why? We're leaving. We're leaving. Now we have a purpose. But when you eat that, this is the part that I want to emphasize today. This is a certain point that you may want to take away. Verse 11, and thus you shall eat it with a, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, so you shall eat it in haste as the Lord pass over. You are eating at night. You're not leaving at nighttime. But now God is tell, telling them, you need to dress up. We all know the Israelites, they didn't leave Egypt the very next day. But God prepared them as if they could depart at any moment. He instructed them to be fully dressed, wearing their sandals and holding their staffs because they were going to leave soon. This preparation wasn't just about physical readiness. It carried a deeper meaning. God had a plan, a purpose, and a goal for their journey. By having them 
constantly prepared, it allowed the Israelites to actively participate in and understand the significance of the Passover lamb. The daily readiness instilled a sense of faith and trust in God. It was a reminder that their focus shouldn't be on worldly possessions or values, but on being ready to embark on their journey, fulfilling their purpose. If you are traveling tomorrow, would you go and shop a bunch of stuff and fill them in, fill them, um, fill your bag with, with all the stuff that you bought? No, when I travel, I don't like to travel light. I don't know, some ladies, it's a kind of hard task for you to do that. <laughs> but I, 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 I want to travel light. I don't want to take so many stuff with me because I have to check in my bags and I have to, you know, get them back. And if, I, if I'm in a different country, how am I going to carry them around? But when you travel, what do you do? You make plans. First day, boom, boom, boom. Second day, boom, boom, boom. Third day, here, there, here, there. But when you settle, that's when I go shopping. I settle because I buy stuff and I fill my house with the stuff. I feel like, and maybe I'm wrong, but... I feel like America is the only country that people have too many stuff. They have to pay another money for their storages. <laughs> right? In Korea, nobody got storages. <laughs> but in this country, we have so many items. And they're saying that in average in American household, they have about one million items in their homes. And we don't even need them, so we don't even have a place to store them. So what do we do? We pay another money to just store them in a warehouse. But in our spiritual journey, if we have a purpose moving forward, we wouldn't focus on buying stuff, settling in here, because no, I am here today and I'm gone tomorrow. The, through the 10 plagues, God was teaching the Israelites the importance of having a purpose. Each day, always being prepared for the next step. It was a lesson in faith and reliance on God's guidance. Do you have a purpose in your life? But before I ask the question, how having a purpose help my life, right? I mean, some people may say, I just love to leave, like whatever. I just like, love to follow the crowd. I just go by the flow. Does having a purpose really help to improve my life? Yes or no? But how, how can I say that? Do we have any evidence? So, Harvard University ha has done research regarding the importance of goal and wanted to learn the effect, what effect of having a goal and the achievement as a result of setting a goal. So they did this research over 25 years. So first, they have selected a similar group of people with similar IQ, educational level, family environment, and they have found a remarkable differences. So they didn't choose people from one rich family, one poor family. No, they tried to find uh, the people from the same background, like common, you know, uh, uh, educational level, family background. So researchers found out of their research group that over here, 27% of them, 
they did not have any goal in their life. 60% of them, they had a goal, but it's a very vague, kind of very ambiguous. Yeah, I want to do, but, but they still have a goal, but it's very vague. 10% of them, they have a goal with the short-term plans, short-term goals. And only 3% of them, they had a clear goal with the long-term plans. The researchers followed their life for 25 years and found interesting fact. 25 years later, the three-person people, the clear goal with the long-term goals, they became elite in society with vast influence on their respective community and the world. Now, the second group, 10% of people, clear goal, but with the short-term goals. They were found were in high middle class, the high middle class financially. They kept making short-term goals as, as they accomplished the previous goals. These people were people that society really needed, such as doctors, lawyers, architectures, and businessmen, businesswomen. Now the next group is 60 percent of people with the vague goals. Usually they were in the middle and lower middle class. They had a stable life, but in terms of achievement, there were not that many differences compared to the 10 percent of the people who had a short-term goal in life. So what makes, what makes it different? Goal with the long-term goals. What about the 27% of people with no goals 25 years later? They were lower-class people who kept losing jobs. They expected the community to do something for them. Many times they blamed others for their situations. They had a negative view of the community and the society, even toward the church. This research reminds us that if we identify as Christians, but lack a sense of purpose from God, we might find ourselves falling into a pattern of blaming others for our circumstances we may develop a mindset, mindset where we believe it's never our fault and constantly expect others to take actions on our behalf rather than taking the initiative to serve others proactively. You, can, you and me, we can all be a Christian, but do we, are we a Christians with a clear and long-term goals? Or are we Christians with no goals and purpose in our life? You saw the graph, the declining. The Chinese economy, the Japanese economy. When you see the graph, the slope is downward, people lose purpose. What if my graph of my spirituality the slope is going down gradually every year by year. I'm losing purpose that God has for me. And since my connection with God is not strong, I don't really see. I don't really see the purpose in my life. And I start to complain. God, I start to blame God for the situation that I, maybe I put myself into that. But I'm like, you should have helped me. You should have told me that. You should have, like, pulled me out of that. God has a plan for you and me. And the good news is, my job is not setting my own goal for my journey. My job is to find God's purpose for my life. I mean, when you plan for your trips. 
The headache part is what? Logistics. Right? That's the headache. Yeah, everybody wants to just go and show up in the airport and when you land. Wouldn't that be amazing that everything is lined up for you? Yeah, the hotel, you can go here, you can go here. But the thing is, when you have to plan everything, that's a headache. But the good news for our journey, our journey of Exodus to heaven, God always has better plans than our plan. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So when I plan my own thing, we have to remember the heart of man plans his way. But the Lord establishes his steps. I don't know where you are in your journey to heaven, because everybody, we are taking different journeys. But one thing that is common to all of us is that no matter where you are, we got to have a goal and purpose for our life. And the good news is, God already has a purpose and plans for you. And you and I, we simply need to ask God, what is your plan for my life? And God is saying to us today, my child, I already have everything set up for you. Just trust and follow me. In this chaotic world where everything Everything seems to be falling apart. Choosing to follow God can make our journey a little easier. We can confidently declare, it is well with my soul because we know that God is leading us and taking care of us every step of the way. And this will be our testimony. So we are going to sing this song together because this is going to be the song that we're going to sing continually on our journey. It is well with my soul.